on, everybody? Welcome back to a new and exciting episode of The Vile Files Bachelorette Recap Edition. Paradise is back, and aren't we excited? What an episode. Yeah, we'll get into it. I, I truly loved it. We have a lot to dive into. First and foremost, Jessica Radloff is with us today uh, of Glamour Magazine. Jessica's a good friend of mine. I met her six, six years ago. Six years in ago paradise. in Paradise. In Paradise. What a, it's, come, it's come full circle. It re- it, I got to say, I much more appreciate the climate that I'm in right now. It's, it was hot it's cool. And sweaty. It's not, I've never, you know what? I'm from St. Louis. I know humidity. Yeah. I have never experienced humidity like that. The minute I walked out of the Vedanta Resort, my sunglasses started fogging up. Yeah. I've never experienced that kind of that kind of heat and humidity before. It was wild. It, it was insane. It yeah. was the most. I have a photo of you from that first time I we rem- met. I, re- I remember the interview. Uh, it was my, the first interview I think I enjoyed. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I, You're so sweet. I felt like you really like, we actually like had a conversation. We did. Uh, and uh, yeah, you really, um, it was the first time I felt like not despised <laughs> oh. <laughs> in Bachelor Nation. Cause you know, obviously paradise, it was like, like it, I, I felt like for the first time someone took the time to try to get to know me. That's very so I, sweet. I, I always appreciated that. That's one of the nicest about, compliments. Yeah. I appreciate it. I was, I was extremely impressed with you meeting you that that day and I, I'm not just saying that because I've interviewed just gas each other up yeah, yeah no seriously but no I was so impressed I thought you were so thoughtful you were so smart you were also very coherent considering we were melting out there and it was just it was the most insane conditions ever I mean I don't know how people look good on that show they say that they don't they look good I mean I, I, like would... I looked my best <laughs> on paradise <laughs> no you and did. it's interesting because I was watching and we'll get into it watching paradise some people thrive on the beast be- beach some people Oh, I'd forget it. Like I like Jesse Wouldn't Palmer last. better in a suit. Really? Mm. I don't know if the beach is for Jesse Palmer. You know? We've only seen one episode. We've we got to give the guy episode. a chance. He crushes a suit. No, I, I, this is not, you know, listen, I, he, he crushes a suit. But uh, I think I, I feel like I, I was thriving on the beach. You did. You were really. It was good for my curls. You know, I was in the really good shape. You know, it was like, let's just, you know, take my shirt off. And it was, no, you looked very good on the beach. I, I enjoyed it. But um, I was impressed with the person you were on the inside. Well, I appreciate we had a, that. We too. had a very good conversation. And then we had another conversation about six months later when you became The Bachelor over at the yeah. Langham in Pasadena for the TCAs. And uh, I called you the most feminist bachelor that we've ever had. And do you I still think, feel that way? I do still feel that way. I think that endeared you to me at that point when I. Uh, well, when that I means said a that. lot. Whatever that means to you, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I don't presume to know what that means to everybody, but I like to think that uh, I'm thought of as an ally to people. So yes, I think so. And now that I've read your introduction for your new book, I stand by that a thousand percent. You're very much about like trying to understand everybody's perspectives and and also admitting that you can't know everybody's different perspectives and the shoes they've walked in. So I think admitting what you don't know and how you're here to help goes a really long way. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because I did put a ton of thought into that as regards to my book. Obviously, speaking of my book, uh, it is out next Tuesday. Woo-hoo! Um, so if you haven't pre-ordered, I'd really appreciate you pre-ordering Don't Text Your Ex Happy Birthday. Uh, like Jessica said, I really put a lot of thought into like I wanted to write a book based off of not only my experiences, people from the show, their stories, some of my friends. But like, again, it's just a book about, as I said, like ultimately if I could sum it up, it's a book about trying to, if you have ever have felt stuck in life, especially around relationships and dating and love, but just like really anything, I think it helps people get unstuck. Cause I've always felt pretty stuck about my choices uh, and my decisions as it relates to other people and whatever you're going through with relationships and dating I, I think that would that's how I would summarize it to like help you feel a little unstuck and more confident in your choices because we can't control other people but we ha- we do I think have more uh, power and control than sometimes we get ourselves credit for mm-hmm. and that's certainly something I struggled with a lot in early in my life and so that's my hope for people reading it whoever they are uh, it's not really a book about a guy telling anyone how to date or, you know, the top five things you should do or things guys like versus what women like or anything like that. So it means a lot that you that you notice that. I totally stand by it all. And one of the things that I loved, by the way, I didn't get to tell you this yet, is there's a part in the intro where you talk about the lies we tell ourselves in order to create 
this narrative and what we want to happen. And sometimes the worst thing we can do to ourselves is, is make up this thing in our head about, you know, well, this is why he hasn't done that. Or that's why she hasn't done that. We, we tell ourselves these lies because we don't want to know the truth. And it's so, it, you hit the nail on the head with that. It's so true. I've done it. I still do it. Yeah, we all, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a human protective nature totally. mechanism. Yeah. I mean, no yeah. one talks to ourselves more than us. Exactly. So then therefore, right. no one really has the opportunity to lie to us more than ourselves. And it's sometimes it's easier to look the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or it's seemingly easier, but it doesn't it doesn't usually pay off in the, in the long run. As I always say, it's easy in theory, hard in practice. But the book is really just about kind of little tricks I've learned along the way that have really, really helped me find peace in this world. Yeah, so. it feels like the book is a really good uh, balance between that theory and practice of like being a little bit more on the practice end than I think most of the stuff I've written. And there's actually some really lovely reviews I would be thrilled to read if that's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one person wrote in saying, I just finished the book. Wow, it was so good. It really touched on so many of the experiences from my past. As I was reading it, every section reminded me of a situation I was in or one of my friends. In my own situation, this book really put into perspective that I can only control certain things. I was in a situation where my boyfriend was not meeting my, quote, expectations, end quote. So I ended the relationship. I tried having an open conversation after this, but was ghosted. After reading the book, I realized that I was true to myself and vulnerable despite my anxiety from my previous relationship. I made the right choice by leaving once my expectations would not be met because I did not want to settle. The book taught me that I cannot control someone disappointing me by ghosting. It's a them problem. I realize that I'm currently upset about this breakup mostly because I was invested in the outcome. It also described healthy love and gave me validation that I was not asking for too much, just the wrong person who was not ready slash did not want to commit to me. The book also described fuckboys and players. My ex who cheated on me was such a player, I was actually laughing while reading this section. It made me feel less alone and realize that so many people go through getting cheated on by players. The end of the book when he said you can actually reflect on getting through getting cheated on and feel proud, it made me more emotional because I don't feel like people talk about that enough. I think all people could benefit from the book. I will be suggesting it to my friends who are both single and in a relationship because it covers everything. He really gets into specific scenarios like just got out of a relationship situationship that are so common. The book empowers people to maintain boundaries. I also feel like people who are nervous about putting themselves out there in dating should read this book because it puts into perspective a healthy mindset about dating. It teaches people to stop dating with the goal of validation, rather finding someone with a true emotional connection. Funnily enough, I was feeling really discouraged about being single again after my breakup, and the book made me excited to get back into it. I wish this book was around a few years ago while I was getting into dating because it gives you guidelines on how to find healthy love and maintain your own boundaries along the way. The section I found most valuable was the part about when it's time to leave a relationship. In all of my past relationships, I've always been the type to try too hard. I'm glad I have this book because I will use it as a tool as I move forward with dating. The format is perfect to be able to refer back to certain sections. Anyone can use this book as they navigate dating and relationships because it helps separate the ego slash emotions from reality in a clear, logical way. Nick, send this person on a what vacation. Oh my God, I know. Wow. This is like a thousand word essay. What is their name? Just give them a shout out. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> it was me. <laughs> I happened to write that about my. <laughs> I just drafted that up on the way here this morning. <laughs> uh, super gracious uh, review of the book by Dana. Dana, thank you for writing that in. A shout out to you. Uh, you didn't have to do that, and I really, really appreciate it. All you B Big Bang Theory uh, fans out there, Jessica also wrote an excellent book that we will discuss more later in the episode. But uh, it see is... how good of a friend Nick is. He hasn't even read the book, and he just called it an excellent book. Jessica, don't say I haven't read the book. <laughs> just, like, just, just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be honest, though. But Journalistic integrity. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for saying that. But yeah, we're we're gonna get into that uh, in in a second too. Lots lo lots to get into. Okay, we got Patrick T. Let's uh, also. I just want to talk briefly about uh, last week's finale. Couple things. Uh, one, uh, I, if you uh, follow me on Instagram, you probably noticed that I posted a picture of me and Billy Eichner. I saw that. What an amazing interview with Billy. That's out Thursday. Uh, it was a dream guest to have Billy on. He delivered. It was so amazing. Check out his new movie, Bros, coming out on Friday. But also that means, as you probably have figured out, that Tino will not be this week. As I teased last week that we were going to have the exclusive with Tino, 
I have not given out hope that that still will happen. I've had a chance to talk with him incredibly briefly, but right now he's taking care of his mental health is my understanding. And uh, as much as I certainly would love to have him on here and have him you know, answer some of the questions I know you guys are so interested in learning about, I think... Uh, I think it's really important uh, uh, for everyone to, you know, just allow a teen to take care of his mental health, regardless of how you might feel about that situation. And so we wish him the best, certainly uh, wish, wish Rachel the best as well. But uh, I think it's really important that he, you know, just gets his heart right and, and gets back to a place. And if he eventually feels comfortable to share his story, he is certainly welcome here. And I am still very optimistic that that can happen at some point. But um, as disappointing as it might be, uh, trust me when I say Billy Eichner more than uh, makes up for it. And Jason, Jason from uh, Gabby's, I hate calling saying J Gabby's Jason, but Jason from The Bachelor Rate will be next week. Incredible interview. We already did it. Uh, he answers a lot of questions. That will be the following Thursday. Aging's never fun. Absolutely not. It's my greatest fear. We talk so much about the show about controlling what you can control. And you can control how much you moisturize with the proper moisturization. And Osea is a company that is making that happen because they have some of the nicest moisturizers and skincare products that uh, anyone could possibly ask for. Osea is a California-based. I feel like anything that's California-based and it comes to your skin, you should be able because to trust. Because Californians have to protect their skin because I heard a stat the other day that 80% of aging is as a result of sun damage. And yeah. we have a lot of sun here. Also, we have a lot of vanity here, too. Yeah, we let's do. Let's just be real. So like combining we, the two, trust let's name us. it. Trust, yeah. Let's just, just put it out there. They're a California-based skin and body care brand that has been making clean, vegan, and cruelty-free skincare products for over 25 years. They use seaweed as their hero ingredient. That must, that must be it. Because it's a nutrient-rich superfood with endless benefits, including anti-aging and moisturization. Osea products are clinically proven to work, and they're climate-neutral certified. Yay. Fall is upon us, and uh, as temperatures cool, air gets a little drier, our skin like uh, cracks, and we got to make sure that we're taking care uh, of our skin, make sure it's supple. I would love it if someone would say my skin looks supple because yeah, that's a detailed too. compliment. Yeah, like that's uh, that's, that's not phoning. They in. meant that. They that came from their heart. They meant it. Yes, <laughs> it's not a throwaway compliment. For Nick's birthday, I'm gonna get those letter balloons, and it's not gonna be like happy birthday. It's just gonna so say supple. supple. <laughs> Anyways, get 10 percent off your first order site wide with promo code V I A L L at oseamalibu.com. That's O S E A Malibu.com. You'll get free samples. With every order, God, I love free samples, and orders over $50, you get free shipping. You're going to want it all. That's right. So go to O-S-E-A, Malibu.com, promo code V-I-A-L-L. -L. Also, I thought more about the finale. And, you know, we recapped it with, with Sheena right afterwards. And nothing has really changed by my opinion, but I thought more about the finale and trying to kind of empathize with both Rachel and, and Tino. And I talk, actually talk a little bit about this in my book, and I, I made a TikTok about it, but there's a part of my book about that's called uh, When to Ask Why and When Not To. And the book really is about the kind of contradiction about why we're so quick, uh, we're so reluctant to ask people why early in dating to you know verify what they say to us to make sure it's sincere or there's like actual meaning behind it because usually early on people are quick to compliment us and who are we to turn down a a, a validating compliment but sometimes we want to ask those qualifying questions to make sure that there's like meaning behind some of those words because when we get excited we can say things in the moment and yet we're so willing to ask why when a relationship is over or we're disappointed. And when a relationship is over, when we are asking why, we don't really want to know why. Like why, you know, like again, acceptance comes from accepting the situation. It's not necessarily getting answers. Is, are you really getting closure from someone telling you once again and re-clarifying why they don't want to hang out with you anymore or why they don't like you? And so while it's very understandable, and I think we've all been there in Rachel's shoes, like, it's our egos that want to know why, right? Mm -hmm. And so I get why Rachel, while talking to Tino and at AFR, was asking why, 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 why. But, you know, here you have Tino. Like, I think we often confuse reasons and justifications. Like, sometimes uh, a justification is a reason, but not vice versa. And I think we, we will often confuse that, right? And I know you, and like, law and order. 
Right. We've all watched Law and Order. I know you SVU fans out there. I know a lot of people on this podcast are probably big Law and Order fans. And think about it. Every episode, crime's committed, and they're always like to help them solve a crime are thinking about what's the motive? What's their reason for ma- committing the crime? Like it helps them solve a crime. Who is who was motivated to do this? That's a reason. Like it's like, oh, like why'd you rob the bank? You know, well, I needed the money. It's like, okay, great. Well, you're still going to jail. Like that's not a justification. It is a reason. And when you say are cheated on and you start asking why like people have their reasons for for cheating it's not a justification you know maybe the reason was like oh you gave the ring back or you stopped paying attention to me you didn't make me feel seen things like that you didn't spend quality time with me those are all reasons none of them are justifications mm-hmm. right and so when Rachel is up there kind of keep asking Tina why Tina was trying to answer her question, but every time he opened up his mouth, it felt like an attack to Rachel. And I, it's, and I think a lot of people, because the discourse out there after the show, it seemed like everyone was on the same page. What Tino did was wrong. No, there was no d- dispute about like, if the guy cheated, then that's wrong. Like I, very few people are, I, I think there's very few people out there being like, no, nah, cheating's fine. Like <laughs> that was, that was pretty much unanimous. But the discourse seemed pretty split down the middle middle with between, oh, Tino was trying to explain himself versus like, oh, no, Tino was trying to blame Rachel. Mm-hmm. And I think for the people who th- are thinking like Tino was trying to blame Rachel, I, again, I can understand and maybe you related to Rachel's experience. Maybe you've been cheated on in the past. I, I've been cheated on before. But when you ask a cheater why they cheated on you, trust me, they're going to they have their reasons. And when you ask a question that deep down you don't really want to know, but your ego does, because your ego doesn't want to think that you could ever get cheated on. Mm -hmm. Your ego wants to think, oh, like, I I can never be cheated on. Why did you do that? And all of a sudden they're like, well, you didn't spend enough time for me. That's going to feel like an attack on your character, even though they might not even mean it. They're just like, well, if I'm being real, like, you know, we were at X, Y, and Z. Now that the person who stepped out, they could have handled it a better way. They could have communicated the problem, worked with you, gone to couples therapy. Again, they didn't justify their their actions by giving you their reason, but they do have their reasons. And so I think that's what we saw in AFR as Rachel wanting reasons because that's a human thing to want and Tino trying to give her reasons because he had them. And some people felt like he was trying to make it a, justifying his actions. And certainly Rachel seemed to feel that way. And I think that's where you found the big disconnect. Yeah. And again, I, I empathize with both of them, but I feel like that's what was really going on like, like, like from my point of view. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember you posted this on Instagram, a video yeah. where you were talking about yeah. this a few days ago, and I thought it was so smart. And it was You were so right about everything. And I was kind of actually shocked when Jesse said, oh, Tino is here now. Let's bring him out. I'm like, wait, didn't we already rehash this at this this location that Rachel and, and Tino were at? They, I'm like, we're going to talk about it again. What else is there to say? So, you know, it's like, you do feel for Rachel. It's an awful situation to be in. But like you said, you're not going to get an answer. At that point, it's like, just say like, all right, it's over. It is what it is. Goodbye. Well, that's the thing. You because know? for most of us, cheating is a non-negotiable. Hey, if you cheat on me, we can no longer date. You violated my trust. Yeah. So it's kind of like, hey, you you ceased, you know, you ceased to be the person I thought you were. I thought of you as someone who, regardless of our issues and problems, that you would address them in a more emotionally mature way rather than do the like low character thing or having a low character moment. And listen, that was a low character moment for Tino, but like we have made mistakes. And again, I think there's a lot of discourse. There's a lot of questions out there. I certainly, I do think there's sides to every story. I I do want to know while not have a justification. I'd love to, you know, get some context around what, what happened because like I have, you know, think about it. Like Tino did own up to it. I know Rachel was like, it wasn't right away. And I'm not saying you should give him a Nobel Prize for owning his mistake, but not everyone does. And I also want you to consider if Tino was a friend of yours, a sibling or whatever, if you know what you knew now and you had the power of time travel, if you knew how things would play out, regardless of how angry you were at Tino, if you could go back in time, would you tell Tino to uh, own up to the cheating or just end the relationship? Because do, do we feel like what played out after Tino admitted it to Rachel was equitable and okay? Because I don't feel like, like if Tino, if I'm being honest, if Tino was my friend, I would have been like, just end the relationship. But like you, Tino, Tino tried to do the right thing by owning up to it. And I'm sure he, he's not stupid. He, he knew that 
once I own up to this, I have no control over how Rachel and the show is going to handle it. And we all saw how they handle it. And it sure didn't seem very okay to a lot of people in terms of, yes, the guy made a mistake, but we absolutely put him on blast. And I'm like, if we're being real, if Tino was your friend Mm -hmm. who made a mistake, would you have told him to own up to it? I mean, I'm such a big fan of being honest all the time. So I say, yes, he should have. Even if you knew, like I'm saying, yeah, I, I would too. But like, if you could go back in time and you you knew that if you went up to it, it's going to play out the way it did. Would you still do it? I think, yeah, because when you, because it's going to hurt you, whatever, regardless down the road, like it's going to come back to bite you eventually. No, you I know, know, but I just, he probably, I don't know. I just don't know if I, listen, I know the righteous thing to say is yes, but if I'm, if I'm being real with my friend, I would have been like, well, if you could just end the relationship, I don't think you should not. I don't think you should stay in this relationship and not communicate what you did. Right. But if you own up to this, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I think maybe the punishment is should be more of a deterrent from the action, though, than like the honesty or disclosure of the action. And again, I'm, you know? I'm, not, I'm not debating what the righteous thing to do is, but I think if we're keeping it real and we're being honest, if I mean, put yourself in your shoes. If If you, let's say... You know, I like to think I've I've never cheated. I have strong opinions on cheaters. But if you made a mistake, if you knew that you could either just end the relationship and and address it and find out afterwards or maybe own up to it after the show is over or uh, be made an example of on national television and and sacrifice your mental health, like, would you really do that? I, I don't feel like it's most a tough people question. Would. I think the reason I say yes is because I just believe it's always the punishment. Like, I'm not trying to be like, oh, no, I would take that on the cheek. No, that would suck. That was a terrible like, you know, and I think I and you see, like, I don't think Rachel would have wanted to, like Avon to come out at that moment. Like, I think there was just a lot of ways about the the handling of that that yes. were like, pr- like rubbed everyone the wrong way and were sure. like definitively shitty. I think with in terms of like your own actions though it's like i just really believe that like the more the longer you're dishonest about something the bigger the backlash is like it's the betrayal kind of like you say about contestants about how like we get we're so unforgiving with these contestants who get the like golden child perfect person edit on the show and then do some like kind of shady stuff on paradise because we feel betrayed by them and i think that principle applies here i get that but in that case you're you're assuming that it would still play out in the public forum you know, and yeah, if that was the case, then sure, like the longer you wait, like the more someone pays. But if you knew that it wouldn't play out on a public forum, that it would play out privately between maybe Rachel and Tino if he owned up to it after AFR, would you still put yourself in a position or put your friend in position to be absolutely flamed like the way he was? And, you know, again, he was wrong. I, I, yeah. I don't know. But I also think we saw like they alluded to some other conversation that they'd had about I think that had to do with family where she was like do you really want to air this out so I think even though yes there were certain things that were like aired out in a way that was like crazy even her saying that like you know when people say cryptic things like protected in that regard you know yes and no I mean when she said once she said do you really want to talk about that what do you think we're all doing? We're all wondering. Right. We're all digging. We're all assuming. And sometimes when we wonder and assume, we make up these grand, crazy stories about what, are the, what it can be. I mean, every time something cryptic is put out there, people will come up with the wildest fucking stories. And then, and then a percentage of those people believe that those, those assumptions to be true, in fact. Mm-hmm. And again, Tina, like, I, I do think people wildly underappreciate the comments and 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 the exposure the people who go on the show have to face. And again, there's a lot of benefits of people who go on the show get to benefit from and the privilege of going on the show. I, I get all that. But a, a lot of people just get destroyed. Yeah. And to me, I, I don't know. I think it's all it's all very easy to claim you would do the most righteous thing assuming nothing would happen to you or this wouldn't happen to you, but no, I I'm totally, not so sure. I totally get it. The thing that I've always wondered, and I don't know how many people have talked about this, about the finale, is that there was such an emphasis on Rachel and Gabby wanting to get engaged. If there wasn't an engagement at the end of this show, 
would they have ended up with other guys? Would uh, they? Would Gabby have ended up with Jason? Would Rachel have ended up with with Avon? Because there's, I, I think it's ridiculous in this day and age, like that you have to be engaged after six weeks, and especially we know on the show by now that the engagement isn't really an engagement. It's just a, we're going to date exclusively, yeah. and that's what it is. But it seemed like Rachel and Gabby, and this is where the one problem I have with the Bachelor franchise right now is that I wish we would see older contestants because when you're in your 20s, like you don't know who you are yet. You are still figuring yeah. everything out. And when you've got two women in their 20s who are like, I have to get engaged at the end of this, they're missing out on what might be the right person just because a relationship needs more time to develop. So I'm more curious now, like would, if there was, if you take the engagement off the table completely, would they have chose differently? That's a great question. Also a great tease for my episode with Jason. Woohoo! And I'm really curious because I mean, we talked about this in the past. I think unfortunately the bachelorettes are faced with, an, with I think even greater pressure. And I don't know in this pre where this pressure necessarily comes from. Mm -hmm. I think it comes from the lack of empowerment of like, instead of being the one to get down on one knee, sure. you're hoping yeah. somebody else does. And so there you have the opportunity for rejection by not being the chooser. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like the bachelorette is in power the whole way through the entire way. Yep. They, they are in charge. They're the captain. They, you feel the power as the lead for the most part. And at the very end, the bachelorettes have to give that power away and hope that that person chooses them. And I don't, it's just a product of, I guess, our, you know, an antiquated, like, you know, our, our societal, like, hey, you know, if you want to get engaged, typically, you know, the man gets down on one knee. I know we are, we've become more progressive. You got Becca who proposed to Thomas, love that for them, but uh, that's not always the case. Yeah. But in, until that changes, you know, I, again, I don't think we've ever had a bachelorette not be proposed to. And as I mentioned before, I know, especially uh, in my experiences, that was something that at least I know, remember Andy acknowledging that she felt and and didn't want to, to be the first bachelorette who wasn't proposed to. And there's this really like, peer pressure element because Gabby's 31, but she's still. Oh, is she? Yeah. All right, but, then I know, misspoke there thinking they were oh, both no, no, in their late no. 20s. I think, and I think the point still applies because I think we're seeing yeah, like this age applies. 30 deadline of marriage is like not what it was before. But I think yeah. you also, it begs the question of like, did the idea that, oh, I might not get engaged and the other bachelorette might get engaged, like play a role in their mind as well of like, even though they were clearly very friendly, there's this kind of like peer pressure, like, well, it's embarrassing if we both went on the same process and got different outcomes. Like, how am I not supposed to feel like I did a lesser totally. job? The, the, the two bachelorettes really, it really kind of screwed everyone on this season. Mm -hmm. it, it screwed Gabby and, and, and Rachel for a lot of reasons, like had to share time, whether it didn't matter that the show might not have it, it, the tr the show truly could have tried to go out of their way not to pit the women against each other, but because the show is designed to have a single lead and now you have two, we compare. That's what we do. Yeah. Like even on a show where whether they admit it or not, and again, they I'm sure they are truly close friends. I I don't doubt they have a true bond and a lasting friendship because of what they experience together. But we compare. We compete. You know, my friends on the show like there's a level of competition, and competition can be healthy. But when you're going through it. In that moment, it's not leading you to make the healthiest choices, especially for your personal love life, which should only be the focus. And it's impossible to truly only focus on that. So I have a ton of empathy for both Rachel and Gabby mm -hmm. to, to feel that pressure, you know, whether it's followers or like, you know, to be liked. And I know you want to, it's easy to criticize, oh, well, they should care more about their own story. And yeah, we, we can critique that. But like, I, again, until you are experiencing this world, I, 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 oh. anyone who sits there and says they know how they would handle it, it's, it's just forget it's it. You could never. Know. I don't know how people do it. I mean, I would just. I don't like to watch myself do it. You know, so yeah. just the thought of like really just bearing it all on TV, like, oh, and and just maintaining hard. a relationship outside of the show, like it's yeah. the, the, the like relationships starts out that start outside of the show, especially on The Bachelor and Bachelorette, not Paradise. They, you're set up for failure. 
without question. And I think that brings us to like one of the first items for Bachelor T, which is the Clayton and Susie breakup, where we saw even a breakup that I think it felt like those these were two like grounded individuals who went through it on the yeah. show. Like they knew in entering this relationship, like sure they it had existed in this vacuum, but they'd also seen some real insane adversity and like shit went down. So I think there was like this big kind of opinion within Bachelor Nation of like okay. This relationship might have some real durability. And yet we saw that the in the statement that they put out that it was just like there's too much to heal from. Like the garden, like the soil that you're planting this like relationship seed yeah. in is just like not fertile. Like, yeah. How many times can you try to like look the other way, so to speak, about like things that are bothering you or hurt you? And it's, you know, it's easy to say, well... I'm not going to let that bother me because it happened on the show, but we are, we're human beings. Yeah. And even though like I could say, oh, well, don't let it bother you. It's your ego. Like, again, like, as I always say, like these things are much easier in theory and hard in practice. Again, we, we critique this show. We're going to about to critique and have some fun recapping Bachelor in Paradise. This is an edited show. We don't know these people. We're critiquing behaviors we see on the show. Right. Uh, we're, we, we don't, you know. We're not above the fray. We're not above the fray. <laughs> But like, let's just remember that we don't know them. We're not judging their character as human beings, yeah. and and do and people do make mistakes. I've made a ton of mistakes on this show. I've been criticized. It's okay. I accept the criticism. I always hoped that people would give me an opportunity if they wanted to meet me in person to like learn about who I was, and, and that's it. And like, let's just be careful to do that with, with all these people. But. I'm really sad about uh, Clayton and Susie. So was I. I really, I really loved them. I think mean, I've I've talked about that before. I still, I still love them as individuals. I haven't a chance to meet Clayton in person, but I'll, as I'll always say, like piggybacking on what if I just talked about, it's really hard to navigate this world. It's harder to criticism. I would. No one was harder on Clayton for the choices and mistakes he made during his season. But like, I have so much respect for Clayton because he was willing to like hear it learn from it, accept it, not try to make excuses and be better for it. And you will always have my like unconditional respect because like that's all we can really do. And I think I felt like Clayton really owned his his mistakes and his choices. I, I think, well, he might not be your cup of tea or whatever, but I feel like that's that was a high character moment for him to own own his mistake because like we we none of us. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think Gabby and Rachel would even admit moments. now yeah, after so. going through their season that they probably like feel for Clayton a lot more seeing what they experience. I, so, I hope so. That would yeah. be like one question I have for both of them is like, how do you see what happened to you with Clayton? Mm -hmm. and do you see it differently at all? Again, yeah. it doesn't excuse anything Clayton might have done, but you can still have empathy for the difficult position. Like I wish we all made the right choices when faced with adversity. And I wish we all had high character moments, but we we don't always. Yeah. But I'm sad for them. I really Also it was so cute. Yeah. It must have been so sad and like in their chat, like their texts going back and forth, being like, which picture should we use for this breakup post? <laughs> and it's such a great post. Yeah, like, it makes me Yeah. Uh, well, you never know world, what could happen down the know. road. Well, yeah, well, never know. Speaking of down the road, yeah. uh, <laughs> speaking of down the road, Peter and what Kelly. The fuck oh, yeah. Peter and Kelly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> can you send them a copy of this book? <laughs> no. Stop texting your ex. Happy birthday! But see, you know what? You. That brings me back to when you were just saying earlier in the podcast about like. Would should Tino have admitted, you know, that he kissed someone else and broken up? Like, look how this relationship has played out post show, like on Instagram, everywhere. Like, we, I feel like we're watching the show continue with these two. With, should I, I should, so, should you I know, reach out to him and have him on? Yeah, yes. someone, someone else probably has. We I'll DM him right after the show. I am curious. I mean, like, listen, I we've had fun with this before. Kelly went on a kind of a PR like. She was not kind to Peter post breakup. <laughs> I know. And listen, I don't I wasn't there. I don't know what they experienced. <laughs> she had every right to to communicate her frustrations. Like I get sharing it, but like if if I'm Peter, I'm just like, hey, like there's just a lot of pressure of being perfect. But then there's also conversely the like we'll choose familiar pain over unfamiliar pain yeah. every time. And so it's like maybe there's an element of like it's gotten pretty, pretty bad. And at least we know what that looks like. I guess. But it's, I, it's still insane. <laughs> I'm it's, really curious what brought them back together. I, yeah, you got to have Peter As on. End of, I would love to have them both on together. This just makes me miss Chicago. I'm looking at I know. I was also thinking. 
I, I, was in Ch- I was in Chicago the other week and I remember it was a beautiful night and I was like, oh, oh, I, I nothing like it. Miss, I miss, I this miss place. it. I miss yeah. the food. My favorite donuts are there. That's what I'm thinking of right now. I, uh, I'm dying to find out uh, what maybe there's something to learn from. But I, I, I hope what brought them back together was love. more healthy <laughs> yeah, choices. I it was love. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, it's tough. And not toxic stimulation. I, yeah, yeah. I've got, listen, I've gotten back together with exes plenty of times in my life. Typically wasn't for the right reasons, but there are exceptions to every rule. I'm curious why they feel they are the exception. They must feel that. Yeah. I and mean, we all do when we, we, when we make these choices. Right. You can um, write about this in your next book. Yeah. Yes. I don't know, but uh, I, am, I am dying to know. Yeah, well, fascinating. Final point of Bachelor T: We have a brand new relationship. Uh, Mike Johnson and Megan Kang. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Megan Hang, Megan, Megan Kang, King, friend Real of show. Housewife. Yeah, friend of show, <laughs> lovely person. I haven't yet to meet Mike in person. Talked to him on the phone. Heard nothing but good things. Uh, I've never met him in person. I've interviewed him once. Very lovely. Yeah. Listen, finding love is so damn hard. So if good anybody for that. like finds that connection i'm thrilled it's so hard to get to that point so, also like good for them they could just literally be having a conversation about fantasy football there <laughs> well so okay so originally because it like <laughs> it's loud in clubs and you yeah, do have to like they're at a strip club in vegas that's a strip club is that spearmint rhino? really sorry hold on no that's not no they don't allow pictures at spearmint rhino um i'll there's a, another photo that i can pull up in a, just a moment but quickly they did meet while he was being interviewed for her podcast and so at first it was sort of like oh they're just having fun stop speculating on this um but then they were on the red carpet uh they went to the iheart music, music festival? radio festival together um and they were joking about how being like you know this is our second first and second dates so it is definitely a budding romance that is not an established connection but they both confirmed that they're dating or going on dates at least. Good for them. Well, good, good for them. <laughs> Dying to find out more. A lot of, a lot of uh, love being butted up in uh, outside of Bachelor Nation. Yeah. Should we hop into paradise? Let's yes. hop into paradise. Um, By the way, I tried to dress appropriately for paradise today because I was like, you know, so it's breezy. Like end of summer. It's my last chance to wear a dress with you flowers. Yeah. And, yes. You know, I wanted to be themed. I've watched the show twice now to make sure that I, uh, I like really, got everybody. I really liked this episode. Okay, so did I, I. Uh, I it fe- felt like they the intros were great. When I was on Paradise, I felt like they were more willing to make it a comedy along with the drama. I felt like they got away from that the past few years. And if episode one is any indication for how the rest of the season might be, it, I, I am hoping that when the drama starts, they st- they don't stop you know, having some fun with these people and allow them to like show more of their character. I mean, just shoot. In in the intro package of Johnny, I felt like I got to know him infinitely more <laughs> anytime than on, like in the first five minutes than like any time the entire season with Gabby and Rachel. Yeah. You know, like again, these guys had no time. We got to, we get to get to know any of these people. And between his rap video and his first 30 seconds on the beach, like Johnny's got some game. He's got some charm. It was like really, it's just more personable. And I like how, you know, there's a little bit of making fun of themselves and like leaning into these characters. It's fun. I laughed a lot throughout this episode. Did you have any qualms about the fact that it was like Johnny was coming fresh off of Gabby's season and like did the way that, did seeing him in this context kind of alter your the way you understood his decision to kind of leave towards the end of Gabby's season and decide he wasn't ready for an engagement? Well, no. I mean, because like piggybacking off what we talked about, like, and especially like, again, you got to listen to the episode with Jason because it really put some context into like the, the time these guys didn't have, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Like it, this, everyone's time was essentially cut in half and then some. Like these guys were expected to like consider engagement after a few hours yeah literally yeah and so you know again like they also every time you go on this show for the first time it's it, it's a true mind fuck you don't know what you're getting in you don't know what you're signing up for and so I'm, i think johnny's coming down with a little more confidence a little bit more familiarity with the scene a little less camera shy he he's had some time to reevaluate like his decisions and how he might have overthought, you know, and how he might have self-edited out of fear of how things were played. All these things play a role. 
doesn't make him disingenuous before. It just makes him human. And now he's here to be like, you know what? I'm going to maybe go for it. And it's a hell of a lot easier to be yourself. Like, think about it. It's just like on The Bachelor, everyone shows up and be like, I got to fight with these like 30 fucking guys. Like, what the fuck? Johnny shows up and there's like two beautiful women on the beach and like a couple guys. It's like, oh, like it, this is like a normal it's like vacation. I'm, I'm going yes. to a bar. Yeah. Although I got to say, people. I thought it was hysterical when Serene shows up and she's the first one and Jesse's like, you're the first one. And she's like screams in delight. Oh. And I'm like, but there's nobody there. I know. <laughs> you are going to make small talk with. She was so excited to be the only one, the first one there. And I'm like, does that mean you get the whole buffet to yourself first? Like what? Did who it, is there that you're excited to see? Did anyone else? Again, I love Jesse. He's a great. I've really enjoyed him as the host. Yes. But like... I, I gotta have some fun with him here. When when Serene came down, it's like, and then he said something like he tried to make some joke about her being a teacher and giving up, like, and now being ready for the summer beach. vacation. And it like for like it it seemed like even he understood in Serene that like he told the joke and he's like this could get weird weird really <laughs> fast and he he like moved and he went from like Jesse telling a joke to be like okay this could get creepy and weird to like football analysis jesse it was like hey like you're a teacher now on the beach anyway so we have the beach and we have like 14 guys coming up and you're gonna walk down the stairs and you get about 30 seconds to score and like you, know, you got you got jesse oh, palmer God. football analysis he really like broke it down he yeah. does like his hand things he went from it was like i thought it was hysterical because you oh. could tell he was like all right, this joke, I don't know if it landed. Let's like abort, move on. Abort, abort, mission. abort, abort, you know, like, you know, like it's, you know, Jesse's you know, like one or two gray hairs. You got, you know, like you got uh, Serene, you know, beautiful young woman. And it's just like the the dynamic. It's, it's, uh, it's a little touchy, you know, like jokes can go either way. So it's like, let's just move on. I'm going to go football analysis. <laughs> and it's like, it was such, I, I just picked up on it. I don't know if anyone else did, but oh. I thought it was kind of hysterical. I did. I totally know what you mean. And it is so funny. Yeah. So yeah, Serene looks great. Uh, everyone, like, it's always funny, I think. I don't know what you, but like, you can tell most people, maybe not uh, Gabby or Rachel's guys, they've at least seen themselves on a TV show. They're a little bit more fresh. They've gotten more sleep. They've been working out. Like, everyone's just a little hotter than we last saw them on yeah, TV. Yeah, they're like, this gets to be my second draft of yeah. my Bachelor appearance. 100%. <laughs> like, they get all the notes. You're just like, oh, like I, ooh, like, I should not have worn that bracelet or, you know, whatever it is. So, like, everyone's just a little bit more, like, you know, game phase ready. Except, <laughs> and, and it's fascinating how for some people, that second draft that they want is a lot more loose. I'm thinking about Kira. Because it feels Which, like she came out swinging. Wait, Ooh. first of all, I don't remember Kira from I her season. I remembered her. I think she, she was She showed early. up in a lingerie, yeah. in, in lingerie and like a little stethoscope. But I covered this show. I was like, where was I? I? Mean, there's so that many people. I, I think she went home week two or something. Oh, God. I was seriously, I was like, who? I don't know she who this came in woman like a wrecking is. Ball. I apologize to Kira, but I was like, oh, but that was a that was. But kind she of made a sure you did know who she oh, was. she did. And that was a cringeworthy. That was the most cringeworthy intro. I have to say, I, whatever. Watching, that I didn't one. mind it. I I would have loved because essentially what she, I would have loved to have her been carrying a giant flag that literally <laughs> said "freak," because that's what she was trying to like. She was she was like I in another life I would do porn. She was like wink wink I'm a freak like I'm f <laughs> let me fly my freak flag. I know, and it would have been funny from a pair like I think that was a miss by Jill producers. Jill said that too, right? Uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Wait, can, there's a mystery that I need to have you guys help me solve because I have watched the episode twice now. When Kira interrupted, it was Jill and Romeo, right? Yes. Okay. When she interrupted and then Jill said, she took my drink. I've watched this back three times now because I, I rewound it. That's not a word now because, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway. Okay. She said that, that Kira took, Jill said Kira took her drink and then she leaves right away with a drink. So there was a third drink there, or there must have been another drink there. And I'm so confused. Can you, someone help me out here? Cause I've watched this now and I'm like, I don't know. She said she took the drink. So then she would have left that conversation without a drink to go get a new drink, but she walked away with the drink and then Kira still had a drink. So I need to know the mystery of what is going on with Too many the drinks. drinks. Yeah. Cause they did show a, like a little replay section during Jill's confessional where they showed Kira taking a drink. So it's like, right. where is the, where are the drinks coming from? Because then Jill walked off with a drink. Yeah. So wouldn't she have not had a drink? Well, I, I mean, let's, let's talk about, I didn't really get that dynamic. I didn't really get what was going on. <laughs> I don't know if we're supposed to. <laughs> okay. Well, do, do you mean like the backstory? 
like in terms of like well, the context they, of like Joe Romeo. They all live Kira. in New York. It, you know what I found most interesting about that? I was huh. like, these are three people who live in New York. <laughs> and and I mean that as a compliment. I love New York. I love New York people. I feel like they're a little bit more, a little to more point. life experience, a little uh-huh. more like uh, maybe more progressive with their points of view on life, a, a little less buttoned up, you know? And I felt like I saw three people like, be a little more open-minded. It, it it almost sounded like Romeo. I mean, his name's Romeo. I know. He's like a he mathematician. He seems like very cultured. But when he was talking to Kira, being like, "I'd really like your permission to pursue this," you know what it felt? It sounded like to me, like I feel like they've all fucked. Probably like, together. I don't know. Well, he but did say sh- he kissed Kira in the club. Maybe. Which is such funny alliteration. It just seemed like <laughs> yeah. It just seemed like Rome. It seemed like a very twenty twenty two progressive conversation of like we have a thing it honestly sounded like people for a moment before Kira kind of lost it that that were really good at setting expectations and boundaries here's the thing we've talked and we talk about relationships on the show talked about non-traditional relationships and I'll, I'll just say this once you can master setting upfront expectations and respecting boundaries as long as you have the confidence that your partner whatever your expectations and boundaries are, will prioritize your expectations and respect your boundaries, that couple is quite capable of of anything. And if you have trust and trust that your partner will respect the boundaries that you have set, you you can really accomplish a lot and you can really explore some non-traditional things is all I'm saying. Again, I don't subscribe to that, not for me, but I have friends who have, and it's really about like, again, if you trust that you have a partner, that whatever your boundary is, it would mean a lot to me if you respect this boundary and know that they would, it's, you are really capable of being open-minded to a lot of things. And I, I almost felt like that's what we were seeing between Romeo and Kira. You know what I'm saying? Like, like See, two sophisticated New Yorkers been like, you know, we fuck, but like, we're not going to get married. And I like Jill as a potential relationship status. That kind of how it, it's how it felt a little bit. That's so interesting because my take was kind of the opposite of like Romeo, maybe knowing that Kira could be a liability if she felt wronged in the situation. Like also, I interpreted it I mean, as like, so my, understanding, I think you ended up being right. <laughs> <laughs> well, my understanding was because Jill and Romeo, they sort of like before Kira even shows up, like there's this allusion to the fact they went to school together, that he's always liked her. Like I feel like long game, slow build friendships who like, like, oh, like, you know, both of them would probably be down for something more. And then Romeo and Kira had just like drunk make out on the like in the club. And so he was like, even though I have this like much more longstanding history with Jill, I have technically kissed Kira. And so I'm just going to be so abundantly communicative and careful and polite. So that way I like don't step on any toes here. I also want you guys all to pay attention to how Romeo handled this. So well. We've seen other people come down in paradise with some fuckboy behavior. I'm not, I'm not, (laughs) your words, not mine. Um, And they always come down kind of like a little secretive, you know, it's just like, hey, I'm here to find love. You remember me? I'm the uh, person who just only wanted to find love on the beach. And Romeo came down, talks to Jesse and be like, listen, I've been talking to two, uh, two, I've been talking to two women. They know me. We have history. He just named it. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, Romeo is just a guy who's up front and communicating and well and and we just see Romeo as a guy who's like yeah of course you're talking to two people like why wouldn't you you're hot like they're hot like why wouldn't you you know we just don't like people who are like liars and don't want to who hide the truth right. you know and Arna is up front and That's Romeo I- handed it like an absolute like he named it he owned it and no one I don't think I mean and he made a choice between the two women yeah, yeah. and it was quick to make a choice yeah and I, I love that I mean I lo- really big fan of Romeo but where did the third drink go? Where did the third, I don't <laughs> That's what I want to know. I don't know. Also, I thought Andrew was very endearing with they, Teddy. Teddy. They did Andrew such a solid. Again, the, I thought the editing, the, so the sweet. slow, that slow motion. Pr- did you pick up on that? Yes. He's like turn when yes. Teddy comes down the beach. Yes. And Andrew has like the absolute <laughs> best smile. And they just, I, I mean, I a lot we all kind of fantasize as young people when we watch TV shows and movies of like how cool it would be to have like a certain moment, right? As as young men, there's this movie called Reservoir Dogs. It's a very famous movie back in the day. It's iconic, and there's a slow motion walk. And I think we like I know me and my guy friends would always joke about like, how cool it would be to have like some slow motion like moment. And like Andrew had one of the I I feel like one of the cooler 
single like quick moments in the history of the show to to have a show capture a beautiful smile that you have with good music in a mm-hmm. slow motion turn is iconic. <laughs> and I am so we envious. We need Andrew on your podcast. I am so envious of, of, oh, of, of, of what the show did for Andrew there. I mean, <laughs> deserving. I, I love Andrew. I've met him several times. I, I, I said this when Andrew first came on the screen on Katie's season and meeting him in person has only uh, verified what I've always thought is that Andrew has so many qualities that I wish I had. I feel like Andrew's strengths are some of my weaknesses. Interestingly enough, having gotten to know Andrew, I think he might say the same thing about me, which I think is funny how it works. Some of the other way around, like right. my strengths may be something that, but like I am so envious of, of, of he's he's so personable yes. and so open and so likable. He's such a joy to be around. Uh-huh. I, like he's truly one of my favorite people having met him in Bachelor Nation. A thousand percent. Absolute joy. I was going to say, you know, a lot of times, especially during the pandemic, we do so many Zooms with the Bachelor contestants and you really get to know them a lot more when you have these moments before you start recording because you just get to sit there and, and talk to them. And I remember last year, Andrew and I were just like shooting the shit, just talking before our interview. And I just adored that guy. He was so nice, so sweet. Like I wish he would be the bachelor. If he doesn't find love with Teddy, like I just thought like this is such a great guy. And yeah. I loved how sweet he was with Teddy. And, you know, he's like, I I just am so attracted to you. Like he was so nervous. It was so cute, but like really endearing and engaging to watch. So he's great. I don't think he's a closer though. Yeah, he could be right. What do you mean by that? I think there are people who are closers, you know, men, women too. I don't, I'm, it's not a gender thing, but like people who, listen, he's so endearing how nerve him and Teddy, oh my God, like their date, Teddy, obviously the identified virgin, you know, obviously limited dating history. And what you saw are like two, two attractive, charming, delightful people who like each other. Jumping who, into a big margarita. Who, who were just like, their first like half of the conversation was very, it was very endearing, but it was like, it was very youthful like yeah. in the words of Michael A. I know Michael. Um, <laughs> And it was really sweet, but like, listen, like it's sometimes it, it can be very nerve wracking to, as you know, as someone with the sales background, it's hard to ask for the sale. You know, they yes. teach you how to sell all this, you know, talk about this, talk about that, you know, what you like, what you don't like, but it's really hard to ask for the sale, so to speak. And in, and, and in relationships, it's really hard to like, just own how you feel without trying to minimize it, right? And that and that takes confidence, and and when you do it, people find it attractive and find it sexy, especially in the moment. Sometimes when you see it on TV, you can cringe a little bit, but in, in the moment, it's people like that. Uh, I, men like that too. When women do it with them, when they're confident and about how they feel about them, and they just really own it, and that's what I mean by closer. Someone who, like at the end of the day, can own their feelings without trying to. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sometimes we. We will almost undersell what we're saying. Mm. You know, you'll say, I like you, but oh, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not really sure. Like, you don't say it with confidence, right? right? Like, Brandon, the, like, Brandon's a closer. Brandon is a fucking closer. That guy came down. He's like, I am here to close. He walked up to Serene and he, he like locked eyes with her. He like captured her gaze. It's awkward when you make eye contact with someone. Your natural instinct is to look away. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. He like, and and when he has her her attention, he was just like, I just want to stop you and just say how beautiful you are. I'm sure he has said a lot of other things, not just related to her beauty, but like Brandon's a fucking closer, and that's what I mean by closer. Like yes. what the juxtaposition between watching Andrew on a date with Teddy and watching Brandon with Serene. That's what I mean by closer. Agreed. And you have closers. Michael A is a closer. Oh my god! <laughs> when they were like, <laughs> Justin, not Daddy's a closer. Daddy's got some magnetism. That yeah. was one of my favorite. <laughs> Oh my God, I didn't know what a zaddy was. I had to look that up. Yeah. Am I crazy? Should I? I, I mean, mean, I've also been writing a book for dude, two years. I've been underground, but was, like, I did not know what a zaddy was and well, I had to look that up. I don't, I, know like, if, I don't know if Michael A was a, a zaddy. He might have been a daddy, but now he's a zaddy. Man, those <laughs> arms, he has found his groove too. He was just like, I think you're going to see Michael A, like, what I think, again, I think he's incredibly sincere and genuine. Also love Michael A. I mean, Katie's, Katie's men, some really great guys, yeah. uh, truly. Uh, Justin, I've gotten a chance to meet him. What I would say about Justin, 
also might maybe not maybe not a closer. Justin, super earnest. Su Gen Justin, more than any guy I have met from that show on the beach now, there for the right reasons. Mm. Truly, Justin, maybe even too much, I would argue. He, he sincerely wants to meet someone on on the beach. Like I really believe. He is a, a really earnest guy and genuine about meeting someone and connecting with someone. And, and that's my, over, like having had an opportunity to meet Justin, that's my read on him. A truly genuine person who truly wants to meet someone. And I truly believe that Justin cares more about that than the TV element. It's not to say other people care about it more, but I truly believe that Justin, like more than anything, wants like wants that for himself and hopes to find it on the beach. And how do we feel about him and Genevieve? Yeah, that don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, like they, are, they are not on the, they, they both think the, each other is hot. Here's another mystery I have for you guys that I was, I was thinking about the other night. It has been what, 25 years since ABC, ABC showed Dennis Franz's behind on NYPD Blue. And yet in 2022, yeah. we are still showing these black boxes on everybody's behind. What is is that just like a running joke at this point? I think so, yeah. Or can, like I'm like it takes me out of the storyline because I'm like another box. Because it makes okay. it it makes it seem even worse than what it probably. That's what is. I was saying. Where it kind of because like with Serene, she's someone who's like just like so polished and classy and like effortlessly beautiful, and then they, they show her like cartwheeling with the black box, and it's like, oh, okay, party, Serene. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like, hate it because I think it. Yeah, I think it draws unnecessary attention to specifically women who. It implies they're doing something wrong. Right. Oh, right. Sure it implies able... that like we've got like lips out on the yeah. beach. Yeah. Like Dennis Franz did it 20, 30 yeah. years ago. I, I well, don't, who cares? I, I don't like it. I, I mean, I think they did that, but I think they could lose that and, and not necessarily because it like I think subconsciously it it's it, it's suggesting that anyone who is wearing a black box is dressing inappropriately. inappropriately. Yes. Yeah. Say preach it, Nick. It's like a dress code violation yeah. of TV. Yes. I kinda I kinda hate it. You know people. Yeah. Spread the word. Um, Tell people. I mean, speaking of dress, though, how do we feel about Jacob, the man who came down with a leaf on I his... think Jacob, the name, does not suit him at all. That's what I what think. What would you call him? <laughs> Tarzan. <laughs> like, why I'm not having call... sex with you, Tarzan. Yeah. Also, Best that was ever. another thing I noticed. I'm telling you, I was picking up on all the observations. When Jacob and Shanae were making out... They managed to hold their drink so steady it did not spill at all. I Pros. mean, I, I would have had it all over me. Like <laughs> I'm like, wow, they've got some experience here with the with the drinks. That was filled to the top and it just stayed that way. I, I, Nick, I know what you're gonna say. What? Are you gonna talk about Shanae's redemption arc? Well, not yet, but yes. <laughs> I, I mean, Jacob, I I loved it because it was he was having fun. Yeah. I mean, clearly he's having fun. Let's have some fun. I good for him. Like he played into uh, that it. That is not what the name I that, that I think no. of. <laughs> like, would I cringe? Yes. Like, but like, it's his thing. And like, good for him for like leaning into his character. But Jacob had me quaking in my boots because at the beginning he was talking about what he likes in women. He's like, you know, and with their eyebrows, I like them to be like kind oh, yeah, of full. The and he was talking about the eyebrows in such detail. And that's totally the kind of thing that like, if I'm dating men, like, I don't think I need to worry about that to that level of like detail oriented than with women but like he was like you know like it's the kind of thing where it's like when you're having girls talk it's like he's not gonna notice that who gives a shit like and he noticed oh, like yeah he is like so detailed about that area do you think he notices or just knows to be specific because it will like make him seem unique a little I don't bit think of both. it was like a like oh he's so thoughtful it was like oh he's so specific with yeah. his requirements for attraction <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> then I was looking at Genevieve's eyebrows because I was like, because that was the next person they showed. I was like, what does he think of her? I know. Like, I'd like to know, like, his, you know, people that he rates eyebrows for. I, it makes me so, so, even talking about this, I'm like, nobody look at my eyebrows <laughs> because it makes me so self conscious. What I will say, next time you watch, check out Johnny's eyebrows. Beautiful. Trip. They're a trip. Yeah. Now I got to look. More. What do we think of, of Hunter deciding, you know, like, well, Jacob's going to be Tarzan. Hunter's like, you know what? I'm going to fly that flag for IBS and just like oh gosh, immediate shit jokes and poop jokes. I mean, good, good for her, I guess. Everyone poops, but... What? You hate poop. I, I'm just like, I accept it as a reality of something that happens. It's I like feel like someone... you're in the 75th percentile, at least, for people who feel discomfort <laughs> and disdain for bowel movements. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is Hunter is someone who had an early exit on her season. We, I'm sure a lot of people were like, who the fuck is Hunter? Yeah, I didn't remember her. I'm pretty and, sure and I, she was the snake lady also. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah. But like, 
I, I, I couldn't help but think Hunter was like, all right, well, it didn't go the way I wanted. Like, how do I get people to remember me? Like, what are, what's something that I can own? What's something that I identify with that other people might struggle with? I mean, hey, it's, I'm sure a lot of people like a, a, a struggle with that. Men, women, you, yeah. know, you know, and she's like, you know what? I'm just going to own shit. No pun intended. I'm going <laughs> to, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about how I can't, like I, at any moment I might shit my pants. It feels like the. <laughs> I and mean, it's just like, what a. <laughs> I guess. The hot girl IBS movement is strong. We are here. <laughs> we exist. I mean, I mean, yeah, again. So I also, I think, I do feel like IBS. Of gender. I mean, been, like, yeah. I'm just like. No, no, no. It's definitely a gender defying thing, but I also feel like there has been a rise on the internet of like the term hot girl IBS. This is new to me. I did I, not know this. This is fascinating. Maybe this is my though. TikTok algorithm. This, this, I can't wait though till next week when we get the like real opening credits. Oh, yes, yeah. I live for those. I mean, so uh, clearly Hunter will be taking a dump. Yeah, we already <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly not at the Vedanta. They'll move her to Sagalita <laughs> and they'll do it. I there. mean, they're like, because like when they do that, they're, they usually like, they usually do that towards the end. Uh, like they don't do that right away. There's always like some off day and then they'll be like, what do you want to do? Do you have any ideas? What did you do? Um, you got I, hit in the head. I got hit in the head with a soccer ball. Oh, right. And right. then, and then, and then they were like, Josh, you want to kick a soccer ball? <laughs> Uh, ha, 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 you know, um, <laughs> it's all like good fun. Like I, I, I knew that right. it was going to play out that way. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Josh knew, uh, he might've, you know, oh my gosh. he might've, I just think he might've, they might've been like, Hey, we're going to hit Nick in the head of the soccer ball. I, I do know, feel like but... that was a really accurate thing for your personality. Like kind of getting hit in the and I was head with a the selfie. soccer ball. Uh, yeah. I'm being like, I was taking a <laughs> selfie. Yeah. I mean, it's meant to be fun. Like yeah. that's what I like about play paradise. It's like, it's a little bit less like everyone's freaking out about right reasons. It's a little corny. Like we're, we're, we accept that these are TV personalities who are here once again to come back on TV. And while I'm sure they all are down to meet someone, they're all here to make TV too. And it's fine. Whatever. Fuck it. Yeah. Like let's have some fun. And yeah, so, so true. Uh, I am really curious uh, what they're going to look like. But uh, we do know Hunter will be taking a dump. Should we touch on Lace? Oh gosh. Oh my God. She had the best line of the night with the, what I even wrote it down. Wait, I want to get it right. But she was like, I think I look prettier than ever. Yeah. Remember when she, she was I like, I'm thought, hotter than ever. Yeah. I'm my hottest. I, I thought that was hysterical. And no one's paying it. It was something. I, um, I haven't talked to Lace in a long she time. She was on your she season on, of Paradise. We are on the same season of Paradise. I don't think she's lying by saying our, our se season three a lot of great characters. So many. Fantastic season. There have been other great season, but that was the season best three one. was it was it was up there. Yeah, it really was. So I don't Carly think she's wrong Evan. by I don't think she's wrong by saying I, again, I think it had some comedy elements. I had a great it, I think it was you had Eric, obviously the Jared and Ashley saga, yep. a big part of that. Yep. Josh and Amanda, myself was there, uh, Carly and Evan, like great, great cast mm -hmm. of, of people. I always found myself I always really liked Lace. I remember meeting her. She was coming off of uh, whatever season she was on. I mean, first of all, whoever you are, Haley, Males, Miles, Malls, or whatever. <laughs> I didn't remember her either. Uh, you seem nice. You went home night one, but like you don't get to talk shit. Anyways, what I like about Lace, and I remember meeting her. You, you know, every time okay, you meet Nikki. someone, is like on the beach. You also like this was a perfect example of just how much it matters to know one person. Like, and just even in society, like when you, when familiarity, how, how scary it is to go in solo, everyone who comes out on the beach, everyone's kind of like, Oh, I don't know this person. And all it takes is one person to be like, Hey, I like you. I can cling to you. And everyone else is like, Oh, it's okay to be nice or it's okay to know them. And when lace comes down, everyone's just like, Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. But do you think they person. told them to do that? No. Because she was you, like, hi, hi. And they like had no idea. I think it's just the human condition. I, I we, we, that just happens. You're just kind of like, we, we, I think naturally clicky people. Like we identify with familiarity. We're very resistant to like things that are different. And I think you saw that in, in that atmosphere. It's still always going to be very high school and very clicky. You see that. It's just, I think it's just human nature. But what I like about Lace is like, she was always real. And I know you guys probably noticed this on the show, like, I don't have grudges with people. She was always real. The girl who fakes her birthday. 
<laughs> yeah, but she owned it. She didn't lie. She did. No, you know she did. Saying like whatever, she's had some fun, but like. But don't these people watch the show to know who she was? How could you not remember? It's Lace? Six years ago. So that was a long what? time ago. Not everyone. I, she was. I feel uh, like my re- impression she of her. Iconic. She's pretty. She was iconic and and messy. And yeah. she got which engaged, are me- which is memorable. She she's got messy. engaged. Yeah. She didn't like leave after a week. She got engaged to Grant. I listen. I just think on this show. As we talked about before, people are never showed. We don't. We never see everyone's like full profile of who right. they are. We get, and I just trust and identify more with people who are willing to be more themselves. Like we are all, we all have insecurities. We all have vulnerabilities. Some people see me as confident. My critics might call me cocky, but I. People will always ask me like, "Where do you find your confidence?" And I find my confidence through. You know, it's a trick I do. When I go out in public and I see someone, if I see someone who I find a slightly, like it's, if I see someone I find a little bit intimidating or I'm drawn to, or if I see someone that I don't care for, I'm always asking myself, what do, what do I think they might be insecure about? What makes them sad? What does this person worry about? Because we all do. And once I have planted in my head, it humanizes everyone for me. So if I don't like them as much, it at least allows me to like be careful about prejudging them and just accepting, well, they might not be my cup of tea. There's at least like maybe a reason why they could be acting out the way they do. And if I am intimidated by someone, it just makes me go, they're probably just human, right? And so when I was always around Lace, I, I trusted her because while she might be sloppy and an imperfect person, and she, I'm sure she has things to work on, she is comfortable with just being herself. And this show has a lot of people who walk in polished and, and work so hard to like hide their insecurities and the things that they worry about. And it's not that they don't have them. It's just that they're not willing to show them. And they show them, I mean, like, I mean, I hear it when we talk about, like, I hear some horror stories about things that people have done behind the scenes. And even from your classiest and your favorites out there, Everyone's messy. We've all been on reality. Like we're going. You on don't have to TV. name who, but can you share no, one of the? Like, can you just uh, share one of the th- the actions? It's not uncommon for people. I'll, okay, I'll give you one. Ooh, when when it. relationships when relationships have happened, it's happened. I know mul- multiple times that people are aware of how well they are liked and how well they are not liked. They're also aware of people in relationships, how well their partners are liked and not liked. And oftentimes in relationships, especially in, listen, in, in, in regular relationships, when things aren't good, we, despite we, our claims to love and care about these people, sometimes we can be real dicks to the people we claim we love the most. And sometimes we will like to poke them. And when we're hurting, we try to hurt people. And it is not uncommon, and it's happened multiple times, for people to make idle threats to the people they're in relationships with about if this ends, I'm going to ruin you and I'm going to go to the press and I'm going to destroy your character. I know those threats have been made by multiple people in some of your favorites. I think it's fucked up, but it's happened multiple times because they are, away. and again, I don't, it never happens, it's, but it's, it's something that is weaponized in the heat of the moment and they're fully aware of their partner's brand and their brand. They're fully aware of knowing that that Bachelor Nation is going to believe them. And in the heat of the moment, they have used that when they feel the most pain and hurt and sadness and, and, and try to scare the people they're with. Pretty fucked up. I'm not surprised at all. Yeah. It's sad, it's but I'm not multiple surprised. multiple times. Yeah, well, it's like with this show, it's so it's so I think that's the other thing that's interesting about Paradise is that it's not an every person for themselves. It's like it's there, there are these alliances that exist. And so I'm curious, like in this first episode, what of the alliances felt the most strong, felt the most genuine, felt like there were the most potential? Did you feel drawn to? I mean, Brandon and Serena are getting engaged. I, yeah, seriously. Obviously. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm obsessed she, with her. I feel like she's going to be pregnant by the end. Like, no, but like, <laughs> they seem like really responsible people. But like, oh my God. Like, you know what they did? They, I, there's, I don't care what they say, and I also don't care. But they were is, in the DM? Oh my God. They, they were doing what Caitlin and I did before I showed up on Caitlin's season. What you saw between Brandon and Serene 
is two people slid into each other's DMs. They've been FaceTiming and getting to know each other. I have no problem with that because you know what? They focus on each other. They weren't one of these people. Like what most people bachelor do is they're like in three people's DMs and they like act like that's not going to like get exposed on the beach and they pretend it's like, oh, just like being friends. No, these two people slid into each other's DM. They have been talking, but they had never met in person. This is my, I'm like 99% certain. I'm like, I, I could be, I, would, I won't believe them if they say anything else. But, and so this chemistry, that this energy that, that they were referring uh-huh. to, like, oh, this is like real, is like the anticipation of finally meeting each other in person. Mm-hmm. And, and I love that for them. Good for them. Because like two beautiful, hot people, two sweet souls, like oh, what a perfect couple. I yeah, I think they're just gonna they're gonna jade and tanner it. Not gonna be involved in really any drama. They're just gonna be on a vacation together. <laughs> We're probably not even seeing a ton of them. They're gonna have a couple dates and at the end they're gonna get engaged. I don't I don't see how that That's doesn't why, happen. Did you guys pick up at the very end when they were doing the previews and everybody was like breaking down and crying? And they showed Brandon breaking down, but his words were, I hate to see my friends go through this. So it like it wasn't even about him, like it was about somebody else. And I was like, Okay, they're getting engaged. Yeah. Because there's no drama there. I love, truly, I'd be, I'd be shocked if they don't. And um, hey, Brandon's too. sweet, sweet guy. And also, what a great moment for Brandon when, uh, when Joe was crying. Again, this is like a quality that Brandon has that I, I wish I could say I would have done in the moment. And I'm sure I'm capable of doing it. I'm sure I have done it. But when I see Brandon having had a chance to meet him, I know this. He does this all the time. And when. When, when Joe walked up and she was upset about the Kira situation, he goes, what's wrong? And he immediately was like, do you need a hug? And he was just such a, like a, a friend to mm-hmm. Jill in that moment. And it was so like, and I, I would love to say that I was capable of doing something like that, but I think like half the time I would and half the time I'd just be fucking awkward, you know? <laughs> I just think you'd be in your head thinking about something else very It'd be intensely. Like, oh, I'd be like, I don't know, is it okay to hug her? Don't be creepy. And then I would like awkwardly like pat her on the head. <laughs> you, you, know? <laughs> you so would. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, well, like Amanda says that. that because, like, you know, like Amanda and Allie. Oh, by the way, Allie is uh, still with her sister for a wedding. That's why she's not with us. But oh, like, you know, my... boundaries are important. They work for me. Like, yes. I don't, like, I don't, I don't he runs her, a tight ship, run, folks. Like, fucking, fucking <laughs> tight fucking ship. Oh, you know, my like god. Amanda will tell a joke, and I'll be like, not responding. Uh, <laughs> you were so self-aware. you abbreviated a restaurant DTF, and then very quickly went Jin Tai Fung, <laughs> as if I thought in the context of a restaurant. <laughs> I would think you were. <laughs> I don't fuck around. <laughs> Anyways, but yes, I can overthink. And Brandon is someone who just, it's just. He's like empathetic and em- present. Empathetic, present, doesn't worry about it. And like such a great quality to have. And uh, I really admire Brandon for that. And speaking about empathy, we got to talk about the fact. Shanae was the one who got lace out of the bed. Thank you very True. much. True. Thank- High yes. character moment. How many other people? You know, and you could say, oh, well, like no one was talking to Lace and, and, and so like, or no one was talking to Shanae, but like she didn't have to do that. She like empathized with someone who was struggling. She certainly knew what it felt like to be ostracized, ostracized and outcasted. Yeah, and but she, she did a lot of that to herself she did- too. <laughs> I mean, oof. Yes. And, yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> but like, hmm. I think we're going to be surprised. <laughs> he champions today. No, I do no, think- I champion people who like- Who get a villain at it. Yeah, who are like, who are imperfect people who made mistakes, who definitely made mistakes, but maybe the show decided to like capitalize. Like when they showed, when Andrew, when, I'm sorry, no, when Michael came down, mm-hmm. they literally played Prince music. Literally, Prince music. And it, it's not a fucking accident. You know what I'm saying? Right. And how we feel about Michael is like he's a literal prince. Like he got literal fairy tale prince music. And that matters how we feel viscerally about people. And like Sinead made a mistake and she had some low character moments. But like I, I just I truly wish sometimes for the most critical people, I'd love to like build some simulation and like have them experience this fucking world and put a camera on 24 seven and and see if there are stone throwers. I was so curious because you just brought up the music. You know how baseball players have their walk up song. Yeah, yeah. What would be your walk down song to the beach? Like if you could have had a song play as you entered paradise for the first time, what would you have chosen? Call me maybe. <laughs> really, Ray Jepsen? Yeah, fun. <laughs> I think it identifies my um, my most uh, don't give a fuck side. Okay. What would you choose, Amanda? Oh my God. I would not be on the beach. <laughs> I'm too sweaty. I am way too sweaty for the beach. <laughs> um, 
I do think part of the reason, though, I think Lace was so it seems like it was kind of this vicious cycle because I feel like on this show, both with Lace and Jill and Kira, I think we got to see a case study in like the way insecurity can impact people's response because it felt like with Lace, like I feel like she was probably not met with a lot of like warmth. And she was also probably like felt self-conscious being one of the older women on the beach when it's like all these like girls in their early to mid 20s sure. for the most part and but then she handled it pretty poorly by being like well this wasn't this is no like being kind of negative and being yeah. like this is nowhere near as good as my season and it was i i don't know it was just a very cool thing that Shanae went out of her way to get lace out of the bed but then what did we make of the Shanae and or the lace and logan interaction uh, when he called her loose is <laughs> that what you're talking about yeah yeah uh, it's the first day everyone's nervous also, how is he 26 years old? I'm sorry. Yeah, he looks 36. He looks, <laughs> looks my age. I mean, you don't look your age, but, but I'm like, how whatever is this that guy age 26 is. 26 yeah. years look, old. We look like you guys do like the same like, age. Roll out the, and be this, like high school friends. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you guys, uh, you guys, uh, right you go yeah. to high school together? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't I, I think it's an awkward situation. I appreciate why Lace felt frustrated and upset about it. Yeah. Um, she also seemed a little sauced. Again, when I when I defend people like Lace, it's not because I'm defending their actions and, and not that they did everything perfect, but I just when I I remember being around Lace's presence and I remember trusting her. I remember trusting that this is a person that I could be myself around because she was willing to be herself around me. And she was willing to like do the brave thing of of just being herself as as imperfect as it might be and and maybe the crazy thing of giving and un uh, your power away to people who could just use it however they want and show it how they will. And and she'll tell you to your face what she would say to a camera, you know? The whole birthday thing, she wasn't, you know, she's like, fuck it, I, you know, like, is it, you, we can debate whether Lace lied or she shouldn't have lied, but like, it, it, but like, she owned it. And if anyone told her, she would have said, yeah, it's not my birthday. Like, I was just right. fucking around. I, I just, to me, I feel safer around those people. I trust those people yeah. more, you know? I'm excited to see her journey this season. Yeah. I hope it lasts long. Wait, Jessica, we didn't ask, what would your walk-on song be for Paradise? Oh, what would, well, I came up with a walk-on song for you, Nick, oh. that I was surprised you didn't say. I think this would be okay. um, really, really good, and I hope you find it as funny as I do in my head right now. Uh, is Wright said Fred's I'm Too Sexy? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I feel like you would just have fun with that. I would. I think I'd be too self-conscious that my critics would be like, of course you picked that song. <laughs> like, Why do your critics talk like they have a mouthful of apples? <laughs> because. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. I don't know what my walk-on song would be. I need to think about it. You know what? Maybe it would be the Big Bang Theory theme song right now. Love it. Because <laughs> I'm in that world. I think we, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on Genevieve a little bit. My think? take on Genevieve, it was Genevieve and Shanae that had the drama with the shrimp, yeah. right? Mm, yeah. So when are we going to get some shrimp? That's what I want to know. I mean, they already talked about it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I didn't even I didn't even pick up on the fact when Genevieve's like, this is how I want to kiss someone and she was kiss kissing shrimp. Oh my shrimp. God. I, I lost, completely lost on me. Shanae? Shanae. Shanae. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All good. It reminded uh, me of Cookie Monster with cookies, the way that she did that. Yeah. I have to say. Just, uh, again, she owns... Who she is, for better she or does, worse. She does, indeed. I think the Shanae and Genevieve storyline is going to be fun to watch. I, I, like, Listen, I didn't love... We, like, Gen we, we had the pleasure of interviewing Genevieve a while back after uh, Women Tell All. Uh, I was a bit you know, critical of how Genevieve kind of... How she acted towards Shanae at Tell All, despite her frustrations with Genevieve, I thought was kind of mean to kind of you know, say she's wearing a diaper. I thought it was kind of bully <laughs> energy from her and the women, whatever. And in, in fairness to Genevieve, I believe that Genevieve truly believes everything she says. I believe Genevieve is very authentic and very real. I don't necessarily agree with her point of view on everything, but I believe like everything that Genevieve says, she fucking believes 100% true her core. You know what I'm saying? Like, I believe she truly thinks that Shanae is there to sabotage her. Yeah. And her, I think her fears and insecurities around Shanae, I think, are real. I don't think she's mean girling it. I don't think her intentions are not. I think Genevieve probably has a really great heart and the best attention, uh, uh, intentions. I think, you know, we our insecurities all can all get the best of us. But, like, she is so, like, 
She is 100 all the time. I think she's going to make for some pretty great TV throughout this season. You know, when she was talking about uh, Justin and she was like saying some pretty like, yeah, I'm, she even said, I'm like zero or 100, I'm going to be in trouble. I suspect she's going to talk about her potential. Like she talked about her potential with Justin this episode. I suspect we're going to hear that two or three more times. Like it's not going to work out with Justin for whatever reason. I don't think they're very compatible. I think they both think each other are hot. Then they started talking with each other. They didn't seem to be connecting. Yeah, that was it. The NorCal, the the you know whatever it was that thing. Oh, the narwhal. The narwhal. Thank you. The NorCal. 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 Whatever. (laughs) Bay Area. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Oh God. Now I'm like. (laughs) We all make mistakes. Thank you. I am human after all. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, yeah, I don't think they're on the same page. I think they're both hot people who think each other are hot. And, and I, expressive. And expressive. Yes. Expressive, hot Super people. expressive. I don't think they're a connect. And I think that's going to fall through. And then Genevieve is going to have a connection, a genuine connection with another guy and genuinely be excited. But she just, you know, another thing, it's like, I love how, I mean, it's the show, Jesse Palmer. Fine. Lo- he literally said, find love or go home. Or go, or, or go home. What? <laughs> I mean, talk about like, first of all, don't not be here for the right reasons or wrong reasons or whatever. I don't know if it's a don't double not negative. be here. Be for here the for right, the right reasons yeah. or else kind of thing. But <laughs> find love or go, go home. home. I know. It's so serious. Like, how can all you or be, nothing thinking. How can you be sincere about like your feelings? And again, like we uh, lie to ourselves. So like the pressure of wanting to find love, being surrounded, surrounded by people you find physically attractive, only talking about emotions. How can you make sure if you truly are in love and not having just feelings that could be a million other things but love? But no, you better know it's love or your ass is getting shipped out of Dodge. Like the contradiction is fucking Well, you said insane. you wanted more comedy this season. I thought that was pretty damn hilarious. <laughs> yeah, when he was, was like, find love or like, go home. Or go home I know. or else. Like, all right. Speaking of, by the way, I don't know if you picked up on this. Um, I really wanted to come prepared today. That's what I'm basically trying to say is that I was so excited to be on your podcast that I'm like, I'm watching the show over and over again. So I have all the insights. But Sally comes on this season of Paradise. Do you remember Sally? She was the one from Clayton's season Engagement. who was engaged, oh, was supposed right. to be married she, oh, on the day that she comes on. Clayton had said to Sally, like, I, you know, you, I would love for you to stay if you want to. And then I think she was the one who took it upon herself. I totally to say, remember no. her. She's like, no, I got engaged right. like yesterday. Yeah. And <laughs> I said, I remember when Didn't I was interviewing. Clayton offer her a rose? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I remember talking to Clayton and I said, oh, she's totally coming back on your season, right? She's going to show up. And yeah. it's like, oh, I don't know. And then she never did. But we hear her name and see her briefly in the preview for next I th- – well, it's an upcoming episode at least. But she shows up in Paradise, Ooh. which I'm excited to see I'm that story that. play I, out. Yeah. I, I heard that um, they were all – set. producers were sad to see her go because they, they thought she would be excellent to television. Very mm-hmm. expressive, very – uh, open. We'll see uh, there we go. how that how that goes. Sally, yeah. So the couples that we had by the end of week one were we had or the kisses we had were Jacob and Shanae, Brandon and Serene, Genevieve and Justin, Romeo and Jill. I feel like Sierra and Michael kissed. Did they? I think Sierra. So. He commented star. on her glow. Remember? Yeah. He was Whoa. so overcome with the glow, and I'm like, it's called sweat. <laughs> Michael is nothing but a complimentary. A prince. <laughs> but a it's prince. true. She, Sierra does. Her skin is just, we got to get that routine. And her smile is just like oh. radiant. Oh. oh, She's got star so energy. So. I don't know if it's going to come across on The Bachelor, but I'm confident that Sierra has star qualities that if it only is a matter of being on the right show in the right atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Like she's got star quality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any Agreed. like kind of. Do you guys remember Brittany? Wait, I'm looking. She was the one no. who Anna said she's entertaining men for money. That's Brittany? Yeah. It took me a second to realize it. Jeez. Huh. Whose season was she on? Uh, Matt she's James on Matt James this yeah. season. Oh, well, oh. oh, then I'm excited to see. She, she looks great. Yeah, well, she looked great. I just didn't recognize her. And I'm I'm glad she gets a second I didn't opportunity. recognize Victoria Fuller at first when she walked down. Um, really? I mean, I guess I know Victoria. Yeah. So like, But I, I wasn't like, I was like, oh, yeah. So I've seen her like recently, but I guess for someone who maybe hasn't right. in a while. Because it was Peter's season that she was on. So yeah. it's, it's been a few years. 
Interesting. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I'm intrigued now. I didn't realize that's who that was. Yeah. I had to look it up too. Um, any final kind of like thoughts, predictions, hopes? Uh, well, uh, I mean, Brandon and, and uh, Serene are getting engaged. Yeah. That's my prediction. Uh, that's, I don't, it's, there's too much, so much left to uncover. You know, obviously it ends with Victoria Fuller showing up. I suspect that some of the men will be drawn to her. Uh, I suspect some of the women might be intimidated by her. Here's the thing about Victoria. Uh, I've got to know her. I consider her a friend. She's good friends with Natalie. I think one of the most, uh, on Peter's season and like her edit or how she portrayed herself or how she was portrayed, common misconception about Victoria Fuller. She's a girl's girl. Women love her. Women love being friends with her. She is a girl's girl. And I think she very much came across as the opposite on Peter's season. I think she came across as like the temptress, the person you wouldn't want to trust around your friends. And the women I know like love her. Like she has a ton of friends in Bachelor Nation, very loyal friends. She is a, she is a girl's girl. And I think it's going to be really interesting. I'm really curious how she comes across on Paradise. Yeah. Uh, she's also very expressive. Uh, by her own admission, she she's uh, what I my favorite things about Victoria is that she will own. I mean, she'll own her crazy. She I've heard her call herself that. You know, she she just she doesn't pretend. Again, I I trust. If nothing else, I trust who she is. Yes, and her willingness to show that, and, and her willingness to still be criticized because, like, if nothing else, I can't just not be myself. Right. And and uh, that's what I love about Victoria. But I, I do think she's going to, um, if nothing else, create drama just by her presence. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you know, by the way, why Jesse says to the women to pack your bags, you're leaving paradise? Do you know what that is in reference to? I do. You do? I'm not going to say. It's my understanding. And I actually yeah. think it'll be shown this way. Okay. It's literally nothing. That's what I was wondering. And they just absolutely lose their mind because, again, everything's high stakes in that world. Right. Everything, that, nothing's a big deal. Everything right. feels like the end of the world. Right. And uh, I think it'll be shown as a hysterical moment of people just kind of <laughs> losing it. Okay. Um, you don't have to say more. I just was curious. But uh, that's all I'll, I'll, I'll say about that. But okay. I, I love this episode. I hope I they I hope they bring in... And keep more of the comedy. Uh, I thought it was fun. I, I hope the comedy allows people to still watch it and we can still critique and we can point out bad behaviors, but we can also just like, I think it humanizes these people a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we're just a little less willing to be so harsh with our criticism. What I want to leave y'all with is I know we're really shipping Taddy and Andrew, Look at a screenshot I took from the big like uh, preview that they showed uh, at the end of the Bachelorette season. I think that's NC. Wait, at the end of the Bachelorette season? Or yeah, when they showed the big like Paradise preview at the oh, end of the oh, season. It's not Teddy. It's not Teddy. I'm pretty sure it's NC because of the highlights. Who? NC was on. She had. I just when I think about her, I think about this one amazing dress she had that had like neon pops. I want to say she was in on. And are we sure that's Andrew? Yes. Oh, that's definitely Andrew. That's definitely Andrew there. Well, it's good. It's, yeah, that's Andrew. I, Am I breaking your heart? That, no. Uh, might well, not be now Teddy. I'm I, if it's not Teddy. She's on Clayton season. I mean, huh. it's, I, I feel like that could be seven people. We always see to the back of her head. I mean, it's, it's just not, not Teddy. Teddy. Just Teddy has very distinct. No, oh, it's Andrew. All right. So, well, we'll have to see what happens. R.I.P. Teddy I mean, and Andrew. Well, and also maybe this is like one date. Although, it, I don't know, the water location. Feels... Yeah, that's a nice like. Yeah, I, I know pool. exactly where that is. That's uh, <laughs> that's on the compound. <laughs> the compound. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in the pool. They're in the pool. Okay. The, the pool where? At the at, res... in Paradise. The not Vedanta? The, not, no. No. No, Paradise. The beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's... The water looked. It doesn't look as blue there as I remember. I mean, they're literally, I mean, like Johnny could be like two feet behind them too. That's those true. two. Like, that was the bluest water I've ever seen. I got to tell you. Like nice. When I was there, yeah. that was some blue water. I missed that beach. It's I would go back like... there on a vacation. Yeah. I, had a good I time. really, it was beautiful. Uh, Jessica, we talked about a lot. We did. Uh, before we go, please let the people know about your amazing book. 
If you are a fan of the Big Bang Theory, I wrote a over 500 page oral history that took two years of my life. Um, and the entire cast reunited for it, um, and all the producers and writers, and even Mark Hamill did his first interview because he was on the show, um, and he's never talked about his time on the show. So he did his first interview. Um, Adam Nimoy, who's Leonard Nimoy's son, um, he did an interview and spoke about his dad, you know, being on the show. But it How was did you get all these people to do that? I mean, what? I mean, Jessica, where's this access that you have? I, <laughs> I'll tell you what. When the book was first, the idea was first presented to me by my now literary agent. I said to him up front, I will not do this without the blessing and participation of Chuck Lorre and Steve Malaro and the producers and the cast. I wasn't going to do it without them because I don't think there's a really a way to do an oral history without the main players. And they were so gracious to me. Chuck Lorre did over 10 hours of Zooms. I mean, this guy has like 500 shows on the air. Yeah, he's, so, a, he's an icon. Yeah, yeah. So he was just amazing. He wrote the foreword for me in the form of one of his vanity cards, which he's known for at the end of all of his episodes. Um, Jim Parsons did over 20 hours of interviews with me. His mother did a Zoom with me, which was so fascinating. Um, and uh, – it it was just so wild and amazing. And, you know, Kaylee Cuoco, who's such a huge Bachelor Nation fan, she did so many interviews and she did interviews. She did Zooms with me, her, and Johnny Galecki because they obviously were such a power couple on the show. But they dated um, in real life for two years at the start of the series and they opened up in detail that they've never gone into before about their first kiss, how they fell in love. Like Ooh. I was just so giddy. That's, that's what my audience loves hearing to hear. these love in this book. Yeah, hearing these love stories about how she first tried to like come on to him and how he wasn't having it. And you know, I just was sitting there as they were sharing this, and it was so heartwarming to hear these stories. I'm so grateful to every single one of these cast members who just really trusted me and went there. And that is why there is an over 500 page book of of really who these people are and everything behind the scenes that you did not know. So Incredible. And when's it come out? October 11th. So a week, now? it's available for pre-order now on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, everything. Places. And a week after yours comes out. So Amazing. I'm so grateful um, that you asked me to be here today. I was truly so excited. Oh, well, all your readers out there, make sure to get to Jessica's book in the name. Once again, let them people know so they can find it. The Big Bang Theory, the definitive inside story of the epic hit series. Awesome. Uh, well, pre-order Jessica's book, obviously. Pre-order Nick's book. Pre get Nick's please, book. Please pre-order my it's book. It's really good. At this I... point, it's not a pre-order. If you, if you pre-order it now, you'll get it yeah. on the release day. So, But I have to say, I just want to say one last thing. Like, And again, and I know we said this at the very top, you are one of the most genuine, authentic people I have ever gotten to know in my years in this business. And I have truly loved every single time we've sat down. You are so kind and on top of things. And I have such respect for you. And just the little bit that I've read of the book, um, it's spot on. And I, I can't wait to really dig in. Well, it's very gracious uh, and kind of you to say. So I really appreciate it. Well, I mean it all. Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we will be back. Tomorrow, Billy Eichner. Woo! What a great interview. You um, said he delivered. Did I deliver? Oh, always. Of course. Well, I, yeah. well, this is my first time on the podcast. I don't know. I, I really wanted to like, I don't know, you said Billy delivered. I'm uh, like, well, deliver. consider this is your first time on the show. I mean, Billy's a, an absolute, like, yeah, you were 1A, 1B with both. And, and okay. Billy had a head start because, I mean, it's Billy Eichner. He's, right. He's, but, yeah. It's like he's a pro's pro. You know? Yeah. It's just like, it's pro's. Like, yeah. So Billy joins us. We talk about obviously his new movie, Bros, uh, dating and relationships. Is in his. He's pretty. Uh, he was really gracious with uh, you know just being transparent with uh, his life and dating stories. It's a lot of fun. We also get into some uh, pop culture topics. We talk a little bit about the "Don't Worry, Darling" uh, yes. drama. Oh, some good we touch on that briefly. <laughs> some texting office hours. Be sure to check out that episode next week. Jason, hopefully Tino in the future. Either way. Uh, and Kelly want... and Peter, you Kelly, need them. We'll, we'll they got to come on. We'll see. Come we'll on, guys. See. Do it for Nick. Either way, thank you guys for listening. Don't forget to send your questions at asknick at castme.com. Cast with a K for all things Ask Nick. And if nothing else, we'll see you tomorrow.
Hey guys, thanks for watching, but before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos like our Monday's Ask Nick, especially if you're looking for some relationship stories and relationship advice, as well as our Wednesday interviews with your favorite celebrities and experts. See you next time.